these are the main points that we want to touch on today as it pertains to benefit plans. I think everybody's trying to figure out how much is this going to cost ultimately? And, and there's a lot of projections and we're going to share some of that data with you today. I think even more importantly than how much is this going to cost, the question becomes who is going to be responsible for paying for all of this? And we want to touch at the, at the very end of the benefit plan portion here on just some common sense conclusions that we can draw about the state of health insurance and the state of health care based on the COVID-19 crisis. And then lastly, we're going to touch on benefits administration and delivery, uh, because as with all things in our world, uh, this crisis has exposed a lot of inefficiency and manual process that is out there with regard to the delivery and administration of employee benefit plans. So I'll turn it back over to Bob here to dive in on some of the cost ramifications that we're seeing out there as it relates to COVID-19. Yes, thank you. So this chart was published by the Kaiser Family Foundation. It shows that the cost of pneumonia without complications is just over $9,700. The middle graph shows that with complications or comorbidity, the cost increased to just over closer to $14,000. With major complications or comorbidity, these costs increased to over $20,000. So while these costs look high, ranging from ten dollars to $20,000, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And I think it's important to point out here that in looking at this, and we said this on the, the uh, prior Facebook Live session, COVID-19, for all intents and purposes, didn't exist uh, several months ago. The first case, uh, you know, there's debate over this, but the first announced case was January 20th. So the best thing that we can look at is what is the treatment cost for a similar respiratory uh, illness? And I wanted to point that out, that these come from employer health plans for the year 2018 on a, a similar condition or as close as we can get. So we'll, we'll uh, take, we're going to keep building on those costs. And here we're going to look at the average length of stay for these respiratory diagnosis. Again, we're going to be using pneumonia data from 2018 for purposes of this illustration. So the pneumonia with or without major complications or a comorbidity is a three, just over a three day stay with a respiratory system diagnosis and ventilator support for less than 96 hours, it's double that, 5.8 days. And finally, respiratory system diagnosis with ventilator support for more than 96 hours is 22.6 days. So this next slide shows the cost estimates as a summation of the previous two slides. So the total median cost for treatment for an inpatient admission for respiratory conditions for pneumonia with or without major complications or comorbidity is almost $13,000. The middle chart, respiratory system diagnosis with a ventilator for less than 96 hours, it jumps all the way up to $34,222. And finally, the cost for a rep respiratory system diagnosis with ventilator support for more than 96 hours, it's all the way up to $88,000. So that's the culmination of the average cost for the pneumonia and uh, the average length of stay as published by the Kaiser Family Foundation. As, uh, as Bob mentioned earlier, uh, the study we referenced from COVID Calif covered California in our Facebook Live event last week projects a 12-day inpatient stay for treatment of COVID at $72,000, which is right in line with those Kaiser Family Health numbers we just looked at. The resulting costs for treating all patients at commercial insurance rates are estimated to be between $31 billion and $238 billion. So if the carriers have to recoup the 2020 costs next year, and they have to protect their minimum reserve requirements to remain solvent 
Covered California estimates that the 2021 premium increases to individuals and employer sponsored coverage from COVID-19 is could range in that four to 40% range. Where we need to look next then is um, cost estimates are all over the board. I think the one thing that we can agree on is that this is going to be more costly than, than other respiratory uh, or viral issues that we've seen like the flu or pneumonia. So with that as the backdrop, let, let's talk about who's going to pay for it. And to understand how this is going to be funded, you need to understand a key piece of the Affordable Care Act, and that is the medical loss ratio. This applies to individual and fully insured business. And depending on where you look, about 60% of employer plans are still fully insured. So for a lot of you on the call, this is going to be directly applicable. This is not carrier specific. So all carriers that operate in these markets are subject to the medical loss ratio. Here's what it says. For every premium dollar that you collect as an insurance carrier, you have to pay out a certain percentage of that on medical claims, pharmacy claims, and activities that improve the quality of care. So for our example today, we're going to look at a large group, which means 85 cents of every claim dollar has to go out the door to pay for medical, pharmacy claims, and activities that improve the quality of care. If a carrier comes in below that threshold in a market segment, they actually have to issue rebates to the employers or individuals who are affected by that. So understanding that a certain percentage has to be paid out for those items, let's just look at a chart of an employer who spent $4 million on their benefits in 2019. If 15% of that is reserved for the overhead by the insurance company, that means that $3.4 million would be spent on medical claims, pharmacy claims, or activities that improve the quality of care. It doesn't take complex analysis to see that as premiums increase, so does the 15% of those premiums. So if insurance rates go up in the fully insured market, so does the amount that an insurance company gets to keep for their overhead per the medical loss ratio. And again, this isn't specific to any one carrier, this is anyone operating in the fully insured market segment. Conversely, if costs were to decrease by 10% every single year starting in 2019, you can see that the amount an insurance company would get to retain for their overhead and running their business would also decrease. This is a fundamental problem. And I like to think an unintended consequence of the Affordable Care Act. We've essentially created an environment that incents costs to increase year in and year out. The other thing that's happened as a result of this is there is a ton of mergers and acquisitions within the health insurance and provider sector. So you have insurance companies buying or starting pharmacy benefit managers. You have them acquiring hospital systems, acquiring outpatient surgery centers. Why would you do that? The simple answer is if you have to pay out 85 cents of every dollar, toward a medical or pharmacy claim, if you own the place that you're paying that to, that stays on the balance sheet. It is no different than the employer who's sitting on this call that formed an LLC to buy their office building and then leases it back from the core business. You knew you had to pay rent. If you're paying it to yourself, you get to capitalize on both sides of the transaction. So if we factor that in, the medical loss ratio has actually created an even more perverse incentive that says if you can pay claims to a wholly owned subsidiary, you can take an expense that we're mandating you spend and also keep it on the books. So this is a fundamental problem in our opinion um, with regard to who is going to pay for this, especially when we start to look at, okay, what happened? 
Well, the first thing that happened is we said, we have to increase testing for COVID-19. So the first thing that happened in that process was the government and the major insurance companies came together and said, we need to waive member cost share for COVID-19 testing and treatment. Now, almost everyone has waived it for the testing. With regard to the treatments, uh, it varies based on carrier to carrier. But saying this and doing this, while it may be the right thing to do, is also going to flood cost into the healthcare system, a cost that is then going to be absorbed by employers when their renewal comes up. The second thing that happened is when we took the action of reducing the cost share and saying we need to drive patients in for treatment of this, the projections said our healthcare system cannot handle an influx of COVID patients under the worst case projections. Now, fortunately, we've come in under that, but to prepare for that, the decision was made to say, we are going to defer non-essential or elective procedures. Twofold, obviously, you don't want to go get an elective procedure where you could be interacting with someone who has COVID-19 and therefore spread the virus. But the other reason to do that was to say, we are going to be understaffed and running hot here. We cannot then put unnecessary services into that ecosystem without it breaking. So what can we learn? If you want to drive utilization in the healthcare system, we must eliminate the financial barrier to care. What's the first thing everybody did? People need to get this done, let's make it free. How are your preventive visits covered under your current healthcare plan? Your annual physical, age, gender specific screening, things that we want to get done, they're free. They don't cost anything to the member. So what did it tell us when this was put into place? Well, number one, it says most Americans can't afford a significant medical expense, even with their insurance. Because if Americans could afford the bill, you wouldn't have to waive all of the cost share for them to go get this treatment. The second thing that it taught us is this strategy, making care free, will drive subsequent action within the healthcare system. You can change utilization and behavior by using financial and plan design strategies. The second thing that we can learn from this is our healthcare system struggled with a sharp increase in demand. Um, this is not meant to be a disparaging comment of the heroes on the front line who are doing unbelievable things right now um, to deal with this crisis. It is simply a fact that said the sharp increase in demand or projected increase had to be countered with a corresponding suppression of utilization in elective and non-essential procedures. With that being said though, unexpected utilization also means unexpected cost. So the two things that, that I take from this slide are despite the fact that we call them employee benefits, I would challenge that because when the rubber meets the road, this would indicate most Americans can't afford to use the insurance even if it's offered to them. And now secondarily, as an employer, where this is a top three business expense, your rates are gonna keep going up for a system that couldn't handle the capacity across the board when we needed it. So the hope here is that these two lessons will drive subsequent change in employee benefits and in the healthcare system in general. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bob to, to show you what that would look like in, in the future. Yes, thank you. Now we're gonna talk about one example of what businesses could be looking at in the future to build and drive utilization just like the government and the carriers did with this COVID crisis. I'll illustrate this point using three very simple slides. This first chart shows a knee replacement in Allegheny County. There are 15 facilities that have enough data that they've supplied to CMS uh, to 
provide both the build amount that they charge for this diagnostic related group 470 and what their quality is, the orange line being the quality line. So the green bar is what they bill, the orange line is their quality. The higher the orange line, the higher the quality. And the only comment I wanna make before we move forward Please. is, this is data that the providers themselves are submitting to CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to determine the reimbursements that they will receive. So CMS is dictating the quality score, but these providers are saying, this is our build average for this. Comes straight from the providers, yep. So if we were looking at this and understanding the higher the orange line, the higher the quality, the argument could be made as a member that these three places are the best places to go. If you have a deductible that's, that's $3,000, let's say, you know you're going to hit your deductible basically for any place that you go for this service. So as a member, the best service is the place that I would like to select. Um, what about here? Eighth best, number eight in quality, and bills almost $100,000. We always joke. So we, um, the fun thing we do in our, in our one-on-one -on -one meetings is we have the names of these facilities. And I'm sure you're all scrambling to, to try <laughs> to figure out who that is or, or where it is. We're, we're not going to share that today. Um, but we want to illustrate a very simple point that, that I'll let Bob get into in this next slide. So if we want to retrace the steps of driving behavior just as we've witnessed in the last two months. If an individual chose to go to the eighth best facility out of 15 that bills over $96,000, make the discount whatever number you want it to be. Let's just say 50%. With that member deductible and coinsurance responsibility being $3,000, the plan sponsor would be paying $45,000 in this example. Now, to drive behavior to one of the top three facilities, let's just pick number three out of 15, who bills just over $22,000, there could be no discount at that facility. And it would still be farther ahead for the member and the plan sponsor if the member went to that facility. But Let's continue with the same example. If the member responsibility is $3,000, under this example, the plan sponsor responsibility would only be $8,000. So the question is, should insurance pay $3,000 to save $37,000 and get a better income? Seems to make sense. This is one of the things that employers need to start demanding as a result of this. There are employers that do this today, and, and Bob's going to talk about that, and some of you are, are on the call, some of our clients. Isn't this how it should work? Mm -hmm. If the first thing that we did as part of this crisis was make care free to drive behavior, Shouldn't it operate the same way under normal insurance? Because today, it doesn't. Today, those slides that we showed, most people don't even have access to the quality of the providers they're seeing. They certainly don't have access to the cost information. There's a lot of different places that you can get a benefit plan. There's a lot of different markets. Most of you are familiar uh, with certainly the, the first two here, the fully insured and, and level funded marketplaces. But if you're not happy with a plan that comes off the shelf, build your own. Take the positives from the shelf plans, put in some common sense and build your own. This chart on the right, uh, this image on the right rather, is one that we love because um, most places, most employers that, that we take on as new clients have only ever looked at funding 
as a mechanism. So you're fully insured today. Let's look at level funding. I think we can all agree that the last slide showed that the foundation of the system we use is broken. So to just change how you finance the program would be like the foundation of your house crumbling and a banker coming to you and saying, listen, rather than the 30 year mortgage that you're on now, let's use a 15 year adjustable rate mortgage. Financing isn't gonna fix the problem for employers and financing isn't the place that we should be looking coming out of this crisis. This commentary is uh, with regard to benefits administration. Um, the way we see it, there are two types of employers out there. There are employers who cobble together products and call it a benefit plan. They might have two different brokers, four different carriers, three different effective dates, and they administer the entire process via paper. Um, Candidly, that, that's just laughable in this day and age. And those types of places are the ones that are hurting immensely because amidst a very difficult decision like having to go through furloughs or layoffs, they're now putting salt in the wound by having to do all of that via paper and manually. And then there are those employers who develop a platform that allow them to deliver world-class benefits to their employees administer with the click of a button as opposed to fax machines and, and papers and, and error prone human intervention and also give themselves the freedom to change partners uh, at their discretion. They're totally in control. If you currently are not administering your benefits online, you need to make that a top priority coming out of this crisis. You can onboard an employee, you can automate the COBRA process. You can automate the eligibility exchange between your platform and insurance carriers. You get payroll deductions updated automatically if your payroll is synced. It handles all the ACA reporting. We encountered a 100 Life group who had the HR representative keying 1095 tax form information into the IRS's PDF document. It's not a joke. Um, it's out there. This is a top three expense for most employers. There needs to be investment in how that's delivered to the workforce. So um, more a word of caution that InsureTech needs to be a huge piece of employee benefits coming out of, of the COVID epidemic. So Bob, what percent of employers are taking advantage of using a platform such as this? Jeff, I, I don't have um, real-time data. I can say that more often than not, probably eight out of 10 times when we meet with a perspective group, they are not utilizing this type of technology. Um, most of the time when this comes to bear, uh, a different broker came to the table selling the technology and the old broker puts it in as a defensive measure, not as a proactive way that, frankly, this is just how the world should work. When you think about employees as consumers with Amazon and now all of the pickup and, and food order and delivery, um, the old excuse of people don't know how to use computers, they're going to learn when we come out of this. But right now, most don't do this. Hmm. So there is a significant productivity gain if you're moving to an online platform such as this. Yes. Productivity, lack of errors. Senior, I'm sorry, well, I'll let you chime in as well. Yeah, to Bob's point, uh, very few employers uh, have an online bed admin system in this problem. Uh, pandemic, rather, really magnified the, the gaps and holes in the current systems. So just like uh, the impact that the coronavirus crisis and the pandemic has had on our economy, accelerating change, accelerating trends, this too is a trend that is accelerated and coming out of this crisis, we'll most likely see more organizations picking up platforms such as this. Yeah, let they it should, yeah. Great. Now uh, we're gonna transition the part of the presentation to something that really gets me uh, uh, excited. Um, first of all, uh, Throughout the first 22 years of my career, I worked for four multi-billion dollar companies in corporate America. Um, 
coming into the, the firm 14 years ago, never did I thought we would have a business that operated like this. Uh, the way that the insurance industry typically works, uh, you can't be more than 10 feet from your file cabinet. Uh, you have to have everybody clustered in the same geography right down the hall from, this, uh, from each other. And the moment the phone rings, you're ready to hop in the car and drive down the street. Um, those days are long gone. And I'm happy to say um, Bob Jr. made parts of this presentation back in January uh, to the principals group of an organization we belong to. And he'll be making this again in August uh, to, a, to a group of hundreds of advisors down in Austin, Texas. We're so happy. I really hope that you take something out of here uh, as we share with you the, the way we're set up and all of the technology that we use to run our business. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I'm really excited about this because, frankly, this is something that we don't get an opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, very often. Most of the time, it's from peer firms that are trying to figure out how we've set this up. So who we are and where we are, we have five full-time employees. They're located in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, where our headquarters is, Mansfield, Ohio, Ocean City, Maryland, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we have a part-time person in Youngstown, Ohio, and a part-time person in Decatur, Illinois. Uh, we outsource our commissions processing or data entry to Belarus. So we also have uh, international employees, which has uh, been very interesting to not only have to monitor state to state updates on COVID-19, but then internationally what's going on. Um, our data support for our Ben Admin platform is out of uh, North Carolina. And we use a firm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for our marketing support cold calling. Uh, our outsourced partners are team members. Uh, we don't delineate. If they were not part of the equation, they would be, have to be a W-2 employee of DCW Group. So we do not delineate uh, between you know, our, our W-2 employees and our partners. They are part of our team. This slide here is what we, you know, our tech stack as we refer to it, or the technology that we use. We are gonna go through specific examples and show you how this uh, integrates and how it works. HubSpot is our CRM. Uh, it also serves for our marketing automation and our workflow automation. So, so things like as an employer, think about your uh, employee benefits renewal, right? That is uh, nothing more than project management. 120 days out, this happens. 90 days out, this happens. 60 days out, this happens. 30 days out, this happens. We build all of that into workflow automation within HubSpot. Our team is automatically assigned tasks. They have templated emails that they can trigger to send out at the appropriate times. Um, if you're an insurance carrier on the line and you've seen our customer service template, uh, you know, hello, we're writing in regard to our mutual client ABC company, group one, two, three, four, as you will see below, and then the team types of thing. It, it just makes us more efficient. On the accounting side, we use QuickBooks Online. Um, you know, you may be using QuickBooks Desktop. I would highly encourage you to transition that online. You may have an ERP system that you use if you're a manufacturer. Um, document storage, we use Dropbox. Document automation, uh, or the automatic completing of documents using information in our CRM, we use Pandadoc. We collect data using SurveyMonkey. Um, if you've uh, been brought on within the last 12 months here as a client, you filled out our client onboarding survey so that we don't have to ping you with 8,000 emails to collect all the finer points of your benefit plan. Um, password storage, this is huge um, for us and our team. Um, insurance carrier websites, as they should, require you to frequently change your password, not use any of the previous 187 passwords and have 14 symbols in the password. Uh, we use Keeper Security. It is a cloud-based software platform that allows you to access your usernames and passwords for any website uh, as long as you have an internet connection. For our training, because we don't have everybody together very often, we have a platform called Trainual that I'm going to show you. And then communication-wise, uh, these are the four pillars for us. Slack is an internal messaging system that we utilize that I'll be showing you. Uh, Microsoft Teams, I think, is another version of this. Obviously, all of us are on Zoom webinar here. We use Zoom meeting for video conferencing. Ring Central handles our phone system. And Ruby Receptionists is a US-based answering system that we use to backstop our 
voice over IP phone system that I'll talk about a little bit later. So let's look at some examples. How do you facilitate commission processing with somebody in Belarus? Well, first, the payment appears in QuickBooks Online, and that's because banks and credit cards automatically sync to QuickBooks Online. Any basic accounting software should be able to do this. When a transaction appears, our 1099 in Belarus can see the transaction and actually go retrieve the commission statement. Everybody's chief concern here is, what about the banking? What about this? They have restricted access to view only and data entry only in our systems. They can't make any changes. They can't access any sensitive information. We also use a generic finance email for this in the event that we need to switch partners. We decide that that relationship isn't working. We want to hire somebody to do it, or we want to find a new partner. The commission statements are then saved in Dropbox, which again is a file sharing software that we can access the appropriate people. And accounts receivable is then reconciled by our CFO in Youngstown. So what happened? This process was costing our CFO 20 hours per week in the simple retrieval, data entry, and reconciliation of how we're getting paid and by who. We were able to reduce that cost by 90%. Not only were we able to do that, our data entry and reporting capabilities are vastly improved, so much so that in the first six months, we uncovered enough commission that we had not been paid from insurance companies on that it offset two years of fees paid to the 1099. In the first six months, they offset two years of their own cost and we get a better end product and we freed up a high value employee to continue to do high value work rather than data entry. The phone system. Um, Ring Central is a voice over IP phone system. There are many out there. We have found this one uh, to be incredibly effective. We do not have desk phones. Uh, phone calls are answered either via the mobile application on a cell phone or the desktop computer. This also lets our employees make outbound phone calls from their work number from a cell phone or from a computer. If someone on our team can't answer the call, it automatically rolls forward to Ruby receptionists who is a US based answering service that can transfer calls or take a message. If voicemails are left, Ring Central sends us an email with the transcribed voicemail and the audio and Ruby receptionist is able to deliver a detailed note that also comes through both mobile apps. Our calendars integrate into these services automatically so we can actually say I'm on a webinar on Thursday from 11 to noon. If somebody calls for me, please let them know that and take a message. If I was unable to leave a meeting, I can actually direct the Ruby receptionist to return a phone call to the client that says, Bob Jr.'s received your message. He's going to be in meetings until 2 p.m. today. He'll call you back at 2.15. So what does this get us? We were able to reduce our phone system costs by 10%, including adding the Ruby receptionist service. This also means that our team can work from anywhere. And we had to be able to do that pre-pandemic. Uh, it's become even more important now. We can also consciously decide to block out the distractions of the phones, but still be available to our clients. So if we have to do mission critical, intellectually heavy client work, and you don't want that phone to ring and then totally derail you for 30 minutes, we can set that so that that goes directly to Ruby receptionists. But if a client has an issue, we can still be notified and act on it if it's a critical issue. Slack is um, one of my favorite tools that we've used here. It's an internal chat-based communication. It syncs with our CRM, with our email, with Dropbox. Unless it is necessary we do not send internal emails among DCW team members. We have reduced our inbox activity by almost 60%. Think about how many times throughout the day you forward an email to a coworker and say, you know, hey, can you check on this? Does this look right? What, what do you think here? The stress level of our team has dropped way more than 60% and it leaves our inbox for the important stuff, for the client facing stuff, for the requests that we need to get to. 
It also has created a centralized and searchable database. So we create channels for training, for questions, for client renewals, for technology platforms, for our counselors. You name it, we have a channel. And I'm going to show you one example that we use this for to troubleshoot issues in real time. Um, when we have our groups and they're going through an online enrollment, we will staff enrollment counselors to meet one-on-one -on -one with every single eligible employee. It's important for two reasons. Nobody listens in enrollment meetings once you tell them what the new payroll deduction is. And nobody wants to say, these are the complicated medical issues going on in my family. How does that impact my coverage election? The second reason is, if your workforce doesn't use computers, counselors do. And we use them to transition groups online all the time. So what you're going to see in this Slack conversation is an enrollment counselor who met with an employee in Youngstown, Ohio. There was an issue. They put it out on Slack where we were able to get in touch with the employee in Maryland and the tech provider in North Carolina to troubleshoot while they were still meeting with the employee. The channel is the enrollment team and the counselor said, good morning, I'm at ABC company meeting with the first employee. The paper kit for the vision shows a deduction of 335 per pay, but the software says zero, please advise. I tagged our tech partner, our account manager, Aaron chimed in and said, hey, if the employee elects the vision or the medical vision is free. So our tech partner, Jackie said, good morning, thanks Aaron, what's the name? I thought that it should be free, but I can check if there's an issue. And Rachel said, please disregard. All of that in the time that they were still meeting with the employee in the enrollment meeting on site. So Slack is an amazing tool to be able to tie teams together to quickly and efficiently troubleshoot issues. Imagine if this was done via email. DA emails all of us. I'm not involved in this. I don't want to be on that email, but if I was, there would be one, two, three, four, five subsequent emails in my inbox of this, 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 all of it's done here and all of it's done in real time. So I wanna talk about establishing boundaries but empowering your workforce in remote working situations. So I ask everybody, what is your organizational policy for critical thinking? Critical thinking is probably the most valuable skill and tool that we teach internally. And I would challenge you to think about if you actively do this as an organization. How many times is your day interrupted to answer a simple question just because it's convenient for someone to ask? Walk up the hallway, knock on the door. Now all of a sudden, that person's day is interrupted to deal with a question. How many emails, like we just talked about, are generated working through basic issues? So I'm actually gonna show you our decision funnel in Trainual, our training software. We teach critical thinking as part of our standard operating procedures as the company. So you can see, we can assign these training modules and track the completion rate of all of our employees. And this is our decision tree. We get asked to, to steal this all the time. Mm -hmm. The first thing is wait 15 minutes before responding. You can start working through the decision funnel immediately, but do not fire off a response until you've gone through this process. You have to ask yourself the following questions. Why did it happen? Okay, we need to understand why the issue occurred in the first place. How did it happen? And my favorite thing, how did it happen? So-and-so dropped the ball. That is an unacceptable answer at our organization. If so-and-so dropped the ball, why did they drop the ball? And do we need to change the way we're interacting with them so it doesn't happen again? Is the answer to my question on Slack? And should the answer to this question be on Slack? If it should, we give instructions on how to do that. Enter the topic in the channel. So grandchildren as dependents. Are grandchildren allowed to be covered as dependents with guardians? This means that if someone else has this question in the future, we can search it and access the answer. And then most importantly, who can and should answer my question? We are empowering our team to say, if someone keeps walking down the hall or sending you emails, it is your responsibility to ask them, why did this happen? How did this happen? 
is the answer on Slack. Should it be? If they can't answer the question, we are giving you, every employee, the permission to say, please go back and work through the funnel and then bring me the information. What I want to stress here is this is out of respect for everybody. This is out of the respect for the person who is asking the question. Because if all you do is become a repeater, I got a question. I asked Bob Sr. Because he's done this for 30 years, he gave me the answer. I spit it back out. I never learned anything. I learned Bob knows a lot. I should go ask him questions. We are not against asking questions. We're against not learning and growing. So out of respect for the person answering the question, show them that you did your homework. And as the employee, go through the critical thinking process so that you and the person you're asking both learn the issue at the same time, even though only one person might be going through and troubleshooting that issue. And we are going to leave time for questions. I'm going to leave you with, you know, our keys to managing a remote team. Trust and transparency is more important than any technology solution. Uh, we shared this with Jeff in one of our conversations. The biggest pushback that I get from people in our industry when I challenge them to allow remote work is, well, how do you know people aren't goofing around and how do you know their work's not getting done? I can assure you that your employees are goofing off despite the fact that you may be down the hall or, or on the shop floor or otherwise. Um, one of the things we did to counteract this, we switched our whole office to Mac computers. And we also set up the feature that allows our employees to send and receive personal text messages from their work computer. We went out of our way to make it easier for them to text. And why did we do it? Number one, we trust our team that they're gonna get the work done. Number two, if they can text on their work computer, they can get back to work faster than they would if they picked up their phone and went from the text to Instagram, to Facebook, to Twitter. We made it easier to goof off because we trust you and we know that you're gonna get the work done. You do have to work twice as hard to build and keep a corporate culture with a remote team. Um, start your video conferences with small talk. Schedule time to reach out to people to just have a conversation about how they're doing especially right now. Your people are just that, they're people. You need to treat them that way. It can be very easy to get transactional and only do business, business, business. We have a random channel on our Slack where people post <laughs> pictures of their kids. Um, we have a new thread going right now for streaming TV movie selections. So if somebody watches something cool, we're sharing it to make sure that we're all not wasting time. Um, if you build an A process, you can hire a B or C player and still get an A output. We don't have B or C players, but when our, player, our A players are now forced to work from home with a spouse that's now working from home, with the inability to have childcare in the house and two children running around, even your A player is going to get stressed out during that environment. Do not make the mistake of not giving them process, infrastructure, and technology to make managing that easy, as easy as it possibly can be. Because these are challenges right now that we've not had to face before. If you can't offer remote flexibility, somebody else will. I said we don't have B or C players. Two of our A players would not be employed right now actively working if it wasn't for our ability to offer remote work and flexibility. We are able to get higher caliber employees in very specialized and specific roles to do what they do best just because of the way that we've structured the workforce. And this was only going to become a bigger piece as we see turnover in the workforce. But at this point, this is going to be the new normal for some time. And lastly, be creative in how you show uh, your appreciation. Um, we do a couple of things. One, every year at the holidays, we do what we call Gearhart's gifts. Every employee gets $250 per child, or if you don't have a child, $250 per pet in reimbursement for gifts. 
Uh, the only rules that come along with that is they have to be ridiculous. It has to be something you would have never done otherwise had the program not existed. We have several BarkBox subscriptions uh, and those photos then of the dogs receiving their gifts each month are on our random channel. One of our employees bought a Power Wheels Jeep uh, for her two boys. Be creative in how you do this. The, the other thing that we're, we're doing during this is we're going to reimburse membership to streaming services um, for an entire year for our employees. Um, if they have a streaming service, great. If they don't, they can get one and they don't have to worry about the financial pressure of having that. Uh, in lieu of babysitters being available, a lot of times Disney Plus is the next best alternative. But be creative in how you show your appreciation if you can't just walk down the hall and tell somebody you've done a great job. Bob, I had forgotten at the start of the pandemic and the stay at home orders, we told them they could all use their business zoom accounts to connect with family and friends. I mean, just these little things, they go a long way. The, the one other thing, and I'm glad you brought that up, Bob, and then we'll pivot to questions is um, the other thing we did during this is uh, we have instructed everybody to, uh, schedule your day to account for your mental health and well-being. And what I mean by that is if it's going to rain in the afternoon, but it's going to be nice in the morning and you want to go out for a walk to clear your head, put it on your calendar from 10 to 11 a.m. and go out and take the walk. Uh, if an issue comes up, we have the technology and infrastructure that someone is going to get that issue and your teammates have your back. But don't trap yourself and tether yourself to a computer Take care of your health and well-being. To your point, Senior, use company resources to, to get that interaction that you can't get personally now. Um, and, and that's how we creatively show appreciation for our team. Pandemic aside, uh, but some special considerations for operating during um, the pandemic. And with that, we've left a, a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, thank you guys. This has been amazing, really insightful, especially the technology stack and, and the way in which you've integrated all of the, the wide variety of tools you use. We do have a lot of questions. We are coming up on the hour, but I do have to ask a couple of the ones that, that came in. So um, what do you do as far as your meeting cadence? Do you gather, you, you mentioned a lot about one-on-one -on -one support and the direct line of communications. Do you have a, a standing huddle or a standing group meeting to keep everyone on the same page? Bob, I'll let you talk about the one-on-ones. So for as long as I, we've used this, all of this technology stack for coming up on two years now. It's not new. Uh, every Monday and every Friday at 1015, we have a standing all hands call every week, no exceptions. It, it kicks off our week with a great start and it lets everybody clear their minds before the weekend. Um, our first uh, shelter in place day was Tuesday, March 17th. We had the call on Friday and the unanimous decision said we need to have these calls every single day. This is our first week where we've gone to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Hmm. So, and Bob, yeah. you can talk about the one-on-ones. Yeah, so we... Um as part of our organizational goal setting, um, we, we do check in on a quarterly basis um, on one-on-ones uh, that I do with the entire team. Uh, during this, I've, I've literally been scheduling check-ins with everybody just to do nothing other than, than check-in. Um, I think you do have to have that cadence. As far as the schedule mm -hmm. of the all-hands meeting, um, the date of the meeting is posted on Slack. And then in the comments, everybody creates their own agenda items. So that drives any ad hoc communication. And then we have dashboards in our CRM that drive things like new business sales, client renewals, uh, 5,500 filings, onboarding into Ben Tech. So we always have a uh, dashboard to fall back on, but we also allow the vehicle for the ad hoc scheduling as well. I just checked. There's already two items for tomorrow morning's all hands call just how we do it. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, we have another question, a great question here from Deb Alt, a, a friend of the organization. So what do you think the typical employer should be looking at in terms of cost increases for offering health insurance? I, I think um, there's several, I don't want to say arguments, there's several positions on this. 
Um, there's no doubt that COVID was an unexpected cost uh, that was funneled into the healthcare system and commercial markets as a whole. On an employer by an employer basis, it's going to impact everybody differently. Again, if you didn't have an inpatient admission, uh, you know, but your competitor up the road did, their individual experience is going to change differently to yours. Some are making the argument that the suppression of elective and non-essential services is going to neutralize the COVID-19 cost increase. What I would say to that is there is going to be a budgeted amount to offset COVID into the future because we don't know if it is going to resurface or not. So it's going to have to appear in the rating. I think rather than project what is the cost increase going to be, employers need to ask themselves, how is our plan designed to manage and mitigate costs? And that is really where the rubber is going to meet the road, in, in my opinion. All right, so we can't count on even, uh, you know, there's been so, so much stimulus money pumped into the system from the federal government that as far as offsetting these costs, do you, you're still, your, your goal, your intention here is to tell employers to just mitigate risks and don't assume there's going to be some form of, uh, some form of support mechanism? Correct. Yeah, not at this point. I think the question that you have to ask yourself as an employer is, if the industry and the government's response was to alter utilization by giving financial incentives to, employ incentives to employees. If you were allowed to do that in a pandemic, why can't we build a benefit that plan that way going forward? Why can't we save $37,000 and send our employee to the best facility? Why isn't it built that way? I think employers uh, are gonna have to start demanding that the system meet them where they are, as opposed to just taking what comes off the shelf. To me, that is what we need to learn from this is when the chips were down, you did this, but we don't have that available to us in the, in the normal market. Fundamentally, that doesn't make sense to me. Right, right. Well, that, that, Bob, that's a great place to end. We are, we are just uh, past the hour. So this has been an informative and insightful hour. We do think you guys for all of the information you shared today, both on benefits programs, premiums, and then also the technology, uh, the way in which you handle the uh, work from home situation and then the technology used to be highly effective and productive. And for everyone attending, we any questions that we were not able to do, uh, we will get to those directly offline. And we will also be posting the entirety of the webinar and probably even splitting it up into two pieces because these are two such great pieces that we want to dive into. So we'll be posting this online. So from the Business Journal and from the DCW Group, we thank you for your time and attention today and appreciate the opportunity to share these insights with you.